Good morning. It's okay. Good morning. Um, it really is a privilege and an honor for me to be here today. As Jerry indicated, I uh, worked here for 13 years, so it's really a privilege to, to, to be back and, and to be able to say a few words, hopefully, that uh, a few of you will remember when this ceremony is over. Uh, thank you, President Moorhead, for that uh, generous introduction, and thank you for your terrific leadership of this great university. Being a president is a hard job. Everyone has advice about how to do it better. But by every measure, UGA has become stronger under President Moorhead, and we are lucky to have him. The president and I have been friends and worked together for many years. Some time ago, he wanted to start an intern program in Washington, D.C. I was in charge of government relations then, so we traveled one July to D.C. to see if our congressional delegation would support us. It was a typical D.C. summer, hot and muggy, and we walked all over Capitol Hill making visits. We got an excellent reception, and today, because of Jerry's leadership, there is a thriving internship program in Washington. As part of that visit, I made re reservations at a hotel where I usually stayed. It was only $79 a night, a real bargain for D.C. It was a little sketchy for $79 a night. <laughs> but I thought it was good enough for two junior administrators. The next morning, Jerry came down a little late, which is highly unusual for him. He said to me, they don't have shampoo in this hotel. I had to go buy some. And I said, for 79 bucks a night, you have to bring your own shampoo. <laughs> He's never let me make the hotel reservations again. I don't have to tell this audience how important the University of Georgia is to our state. As the flagship of the university system, UGA sets the pace and has a profound impact across Georgia through its teaching, research, and service. It has a profound impact as well through its mascot. My high school was the Tigers. My undergraduate school, the Panthers. My graduate school, the Northwestern Wildcats. My daughter loves cats. Maybe this is why. But my favorite team has always been the Bulldogs. <laughs> Today is your day, graduates, and I congratulate you for becoming a graduate of the University of Georgia. You have worked hard and endured much, and we are here to salute you. We should also acknowledge the support of family and friends, as well as that provided by the university and its great faculty. I know it is fashionable today to stereotype faculty, to trivialize their work. But it was the faculty who motivated me as a student. Their encouragement opened opportunities I had never considered. Excellence in education begins with great faculty, and I thank them for what they do. President Moorhead mentioned that my degrees are in history, and I value that training for the lessons we can learn about leadership, about failure, about success. So today, I would like to share a story about one of America's great friendships and about the values that I hope will guide the course of your lives. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson could not have been more different, but they became close friends in the 1770s. They helped convince a band of angry colonists to become revolutionaries and to declare themselves independent of the most powerful nation on Earth. Adams was a New Englander, stuffy and proud, vain to a fault, intelligent, and a passionate believer in American independence. Jefferson was an aristocrat, a Virginia planter and slave owner, charming and brilliant with a powerful command of languages. He was one of the most intellectually curious people who ever lived. In the spring of 1776, colonial leaders gathered in Philadelphia to discuss their fate within the British Empire. They decided to declare independence from Great Britain and appointed a committee to draft the document justifying their decision. John Adams was named chair of the drafting committee, and the honor to write the declaration fell to him. But Adams deferred, believing that another member of the committee, Thomas Jefferson, his younger friend from Virginia, should draft the document. Adams possessed many talents, but writing persuasively was not one of them. 
and he knew it. Jefferson was a gifted writer, and knowing this, Adams handed to his younger colleague the job to draft one of the most famous documents in world history, the Declaration of Independence. It was a self-sacrifice rarely seen today. Colonial leaders knew that in declaring independence, they risked losing everything, including their lives, so the arguments for separation had to be profound. Adams deferred to a colleague who was better equipped to do the job, an unselfish act to advance the larger cause, a powerful lesson for us all. The colonists won their independence and formed a nation. George Washington was, of course, elected the first president and served two terms, leaving office in 1797. In the presidential election of 1796, Adams finished with the most electoral votes, and Jefferson finished second. In the early years of the nation's history, before political parties, the candidate who received the most electoral votes became the president, and the one who received the second most became the vice president. The modern equivalent, I suppose, and think about this, would be Donald Trump as president and Hillary Clinton as vice president. <laughs> think about that. During Adams' term, serious political friction grew between those who, like Adams, favored a strong federal government and those, like Jefferson, who feared centralized authority. By the end of Adams' term, tensions reached a boiling point, and in 1800, Amidst a bitter political atmosphere, he and Jefferson ran for president against one another. The presidential election of 1800 was one of the meanest in American history, maybe the meanest. I'm actually not kidding. Jefferson defeated his old friend Adams, and the transition was tense and hostile. In the final hours of his administration, Adams made numerous appointments of federal judges the so-called Midnight Judges. After years of acrimony between Adams and Jefferson over politics and power, these last-minute appointments broke the bond of their long friendship. For over 10 years, they did not contact one another, but a friend finally intervened and encouraged them to revive their relationship. In those days, of course, you did not phone or email. You wrote a letter. And after a tentative renewal of their friendship, the two exchanged more than 150 of them. These letters constitute one of the most remarkable discourses in the English language, Adams writing from Massachusetts and Jefferson from Virginia. Early in the correspondence, with the years of anger still fresh, Adams wrote to Jefferson, you and I ought not to die before we have explained ourselves to each other. What a remarkable sentence. You and I ought not to die before we have explained ourselves to each other. Today, the modern equivalent on Fox or MSNBC would be, I hope you die before I do. <laughs> but here are two friends, both brilliant and proud and stubborn, who had allowed politics to come between them, now reaching out to understand. And so here is the second lesson from the story of these two close friends. Seek understanding and worry less about being understood. Adams and Jefferson corresponded for another dozen years. By the summer of 1826, both had grown old and ill and were in failing health. Communication was slow, so they did not know of the other's condition. In early July, Jefferson lay dying, lapsing in and out of consciousness, waking periodically to ask, is it the fourth yet? Is it the 4th of July? Adams, too, at his home in Massachusetts, was gravely ill that July of 1826. Early on the morning of the 4th of July, Jefferson awoke and again asked, Is it the 4th? He was told that it was. Later that day, around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Adams neared death. Legend has it that his final words were, Thomas Jefferson survives. But Adams was wrong. Jefferson, his friend of so many years, having learned early in the day that it was the 4th of July, died about four hours before Adams. So these two dear friends, one known for deciding not to write the Declaration of Independence and the other for writing it, died on the same day 
exactly 50 years after the adoption of the document proclaiming American independence. And both of them, in our final lesson from this great friendship, in their last moments, thought of something bigger than themselves. Adams focused on friendship, Jefferson on the nation they created together. You're likely wondering why has he told us that long story. And the reason is it holds values that I hope will guide you. Adams' unselfish act to hand off a critical task to someone he knew would do it better. It is the two of them seeking understanding rather than focusing on being understood. And it is the both of them thinking, not of themselves, but of something greater than themselves as they breathe their last. As you chart your life's course, my hope is that you behave unselfishly, that you seek understanding rather than fret too much about being understood, and that you commit to something larger than yourself. That is how you will find satisfaction in life. You will find meaning by making the needs of family and friends and society a higher priority than your own. By doing something, anything, that advances the well-being of others. So if you find yourself unhappy, look outward, not inward, for the fix. Look for how you can make something better or someone happier. That will cure what ails you. You've been very kind to listen. Congratulations again on becoming a graduate of the University of Georgia, and go dogs. <laughs>